Hello everyone and welcome to our talk on testing Kubernetes clusters and building confidence in your changes. Um, in terms of what we're going to cover today, uh, we'll cover a little about us. Um, then we'll go over the problems that we faced and that prompted us to go down this investigation route and building our own solution. Um, then give an overview of the uh, potential solutions that we looked at. Uh, give you a deep dive into our solution, how it works, and the, the components that we brought together to make it work. Um, and then finally cover some gotchas, tips, and other options um, for you. So uh, in terms of who we are, um, I'm Guy. I'm a principal software engineer at Skyscanner. Um, I work um, on the teams responsible for uh, our shared container platform. So in, for the most part, that's Kubernetes um, and enabling the rest of the business to build applications on top of that um, that operate reliably at scale. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a co-chair of uh, Kubernetes SIG Auto Scaling, um, and I can be found on most places on the internet under the handle GJ Templeton. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Matteo. I'm a senior software engineer here at Skyscanner, where I work with Guy on keeping our Kubernetes infrastructure up and running in the production platform tribe. You can find me technically on Twitter, but yeah, please look for me on GitHub. So um, we both work for Skyscanner, um, who are Skyscanner. Um, so we're the travel company that puts you first. Um, we help million of people, millions of people in 50 countries over 30 languages find best travel options for not only flights, but also hotels and car hire each month. Um, and work with over 1,200 travel partners to enable that. Um, in terms of Kubernetes at Skyscanner, though, um, we've been running Kates since um, 1.6 release. Um, we over that time we have built up the the number of clusters we have to um, more than 35 production clusters at this point, and um, spread across four different AWS regions. And then um, on, on those clusters, we've got 475 um, and more services, and most of them running in multiple clusters, multiple regions for um, improved resilience um, to a number of different uh, potential scenarios. Um, and in terms of scale of the clusters underneath them, we've currently we currently run at about 40,000 plus CPU cores across the clusters with about 150 terabytes of RAM at any one time as well. So what do we want to talk about today? Well, uh, if you run Kubernetes, you're probably aware that uh, it's it's a complex pl platform, let's be honest. There are like multiple microservices, API servers, distributed database. And uh, if you're running a production workload on top of Kubernetes, you probably also want to install a few other components. For example, uh, you, have your, you might have your CNI, uh, maybe you have a service mesh, or maybe you have an ingress controller. Uh, you probably want to do something about the metrics and logging. So you have a set of uh, uh, observability components. And uh, uh, while uh, Kubernetes has a, a good set of unit and integration tests on its own, and I'm pretty sure that all the add-ons that you're running, they have their own set of tests. The very difficult thing is here is when you glue everything together. So how do you test your Kubernetes setup with all the components you care about, with all your configuration inside either your uh, cloud environment, maybe you're running in AWS, like we do, or uh, you're running on-premises? Why do you care about making sure that everything is up and it works as better? Why, why do you want to test? Well. The, the obvious thing is uh, that you want to reduce the disruption when you make a change to the clusters. You want to keep your customer happy, your users happy. You also want uh, uh, to do something for the people responsible for the cluster, so maybe your squad. Uh, you want uh, to push out features uh, for your users, and then uh, uh, you want to keep like a decent velocity. So you want to be able to reliable uh, test and making sure that it's something that you're pushing out is working and is not breaking anything. This uh, gives you like confidence uh, that uh, uh, the users are getting the behavior they're expecting. 
It also gives you a baseline. So if you make a change, then you can pinpoint like when the behavior changed or when something bro uh, broke and uh, maybe helps you like in, in better troubleshooting. So um, we've, we've covered now the, the prob the reasons we wanted to look at this. And um, so we, we started to exploring what our potential solutions to enable us to, um, to do this were. Um, so the first, um, which I assume many of you are familiar with, is it was manual acceptance testing. So the idea of we'd, we'd stick a, a manual approval gate in our continuous deployment pipelines, and that would give us the opportunity as operators to go and run some manual acceptance tests against the clusters or against individual nodes, whatever it may be, um, before manually approving the, the pipeline to continue. Um, the problem obviously with that is as we've scaled up to 35 clusters that this this solution doesn't really scale as the number of clusters uh, increases so it incre increases every new cluster adds to your toil burden um, uh, unlike with an automated solution um, it's also easy to make mistakes and it's inconsistent even if you've made it into run books if you're still relying on engineers correctly running the run books with the correct options for instance or copying and pasting commands in from run books you, you've, you've still got a human factor in there um, and a risk that things won't quite actually be what you thought you had run um, so for that reason, we, we sort of rolled out manual acceptance tests pretty quickly. Um, the next option we looked at was a custom service and we ran with this for, for actually quite a while. Um, in this case, we spun up a microservice on our cluster um, and that microservice had had um, RBAC permissions to create pods, create and modify some, some objects inside the cluster. Um, and that, that was constantly on a loop running these tests. Um, that, that had a good benefit in that it made it easier to catch any degradation. So if we made changes and say uh, it worked fine initially, but six hours later, something had say bogged down the API server to the point that things weren't working the way you thought they should anymore, this, this would actually catch that. It exposed metrics so we could alert on those. That that was a real benefit of this approach. The, the downsides, however, were that the way we'd implemented it at least it was harder to block our update pipelines on, so we we couldn't we couldn't as easily basically say have a conditional in our continuous deployment test of if these tests fail the next time the loop evaluates, then after we've made these changes, then block. Um, and the uh, other was it's not uh, there was no easy ability for us to run ad hoc tests when when and where we wanted. We were at the mercy of the the loop that was evaluating these things. Um, and we could have we could have done work to fix that, but uh, we took the opportunity to look at other options to see if there were a, be a better way. Um, so the next option was building on top of existing frameworks. Um, so there's existing uh, infrastructure and Kubernetes testing frameworks. And um, this would have minimized the custom work we had to do. Um, these different frameworks have a number of different different um, benefits. Some are written in Go, some are written in Python. Um, some are very, very Kubernetes focused. Some are way more generic and have their origins from before Kubernetes. Um, so there, there's, there are a number of options we looked at there. Um, and then we looked at more specific, like pr provided and supported by the Kubernetes, core Kubernetes community um, options. Um, so the first option we looked at was um, KubeTest. Uh, this is a, a stored in the Kubernetes test info repo. Um, it was a framework that allows for the creation and teardown of test clusters. Um, it supports the addition of custom Ginkgo tests. Um, it's supported by the Kubernetes project but it does come with extra overhead. Because um, obviously if you're tearing up, uh, spinning up and tearing down clusters, you've got to wait for that creation and tear down to happen anytime you're running these tests. However, the biggest drawback of this for us was it's not necessarily representative of our production clusters. Say we've had a production cluster running for six months. Um, we've, we've had many changes um, applied over time spinning up a fresh new cluster and applying all the components you think are in your cluster is not is almost certainly not actually going to be representative of that cluster that's had accreted changes on it. Um, so that, that was the main drawback here for us. Then we started looking at the conformance suite. Um, so you might be familiar with this if you've ever had a look at um, 
the certification of um, managed Kubernetes offerings. These are the tests that um, prov cloud providers or any provider of a certified Kubernetes offering has to validate that they've run against their offering and that all these tests pass. So they test a huge range of the core Kubernetes functionality, make sure it all works within acceptable limits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that would have made it really easy for us to use the community's existing tests. Um, However, the downsides to that are obviously because of the range of the tests in there, it's really time consuming to run that entire suite. Um, there's there's some disruptive tests if you're running the full suite, although by default it doesn't run the disruptive tests. Um, and also you're not necessarily testing the behavior that your users care about. Our users don't care about, you know, some of the low level stuff. What they care about is is my application able to scale. The, thing that conformance suite did lead us to though was the tool that's used to run the conformance suite which is a tool called sonoboy uh, it's an open source tool from vmware um it's it's very active community constantly improving project um but the, the killer feature for us was the ability to run custom tests by the creation of plugins so that meant that we could build our own tests only testing the functionality we could care cared about into into a binary and use sonoboy to run that so what uh, did we choose uh, uh, to iterate from our from our custom solution? So uh, before taking a decision like we 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 sat down and, and then we we look at what we wanted from from our next generation tool. And uh, uh, the first thing was like something easy to run. The, the previous tool was like deployed as, as a demo set across the whole Kubernetes, so it was not very easy. Uh, if you have a a, a cumbersome uh, test tool, you're not gonna use it a lot. So we wanted something simple that you could run from a laptop when, while uh, writing a new test, or even if you wanted to quickly test like a, a live cluster, but then the same tool we wanted to be able to embed it in our CD pipeline. Uh, we wanted all the, the things that you probably expect in a test uh, uh, suite. Uh, so run test is here along a parallel, uh, able to get uh, and store and archive test results. So you, you can do the, the, you can look at them over time and see if you have like, you can spot them trends. Uh, another important thing is, is alerting uh, on, on a filling test. So uh, you might take a decision like in our case, we, we, we page one of the cluster operator if, if the tests are, are not passing because uh, maybe it means that uh, uh, one change is uh, one change that we're making uh, that made into production uh, despite all the tests is it actually breaking the functionality. You might want to even add the like an automatic rollback. Uh, this on the test suite on the actual writing writing the code, we wanted to find a solution that uh, was allow us to write uh, the less boilerplate uh, code as possible. So. Uh, to rely a lot on other other people, best practices, the community, um, maybe uh, have like a few examples of, of uh, well-written tests that we, we could take inspiration from. And so uh, our current test solution is based on writing a, a custom Sonoboy plugin. So uh, as Guy said, uh, Sonoboy is the tool that runs the conformance uh, test suite, but we wrote uh, a plugin and then Sonoboy now is driving, in our case, only our SkyScan internal smoke tests. And then uh, we uh, add a look at the Kubernetes, Kubernetes repository, and there is like a, a huge uh, section around tests and then to end test. And so uh, there is all framework that gives you like uh, uh, function and utilities uh, to to reduce the amount of code that, that you have to write. Unfortunately, uh, our uh, repository is not open source yet because there are a lot of uh, uh, sky scanner uh, custom, uh, uh, custom tests, so uh, we haven't done it yet, but we hopefully, uh, we are gonna do that in, in the next few, few months. But I hope to give you like enough so you can uh, uh, go away and, and try to replicate our setup. So. Uh, as we said, we, are, we run the Sonoboy uh, image to drive the tests. Uh, we made a, a little change so that we can easily uh, retrieve the failed test. Then we can differentiate the exit code uh, 
uh, when we hook it into our CD uh, pipeline so we can bail out if, if any of the tests are failing. And then we build uh, the actual end-to-end uh, -end, uh, image. We based these on top of the upstream Kubernetes uh, conformance image because uh, the images already have uh, uh, Jingo and everything that we need to run uh, our test. Um, as you can see here, we, we make a, a, a couple of changes. In particular, we, we change the run SH, and, and I will tell you more about that later. Uh, the end-to-end -end dot test binary is the actual binary uh, produced by when you, when you compile the code. And then we pass uh, uh, some YAML configuration because uh, we mirror internally all of the uh, all the Docker images. So here we are changing the configuration of Sonoboy to, to point to our internal uh, Docker registries. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, how the repository looks like, uh, we basically shift and lift the end-to-end the -end, uh, uh, Go files that are the entry point for the suite from Kubernetes Kubernetes. And then we, we, we wrote like uh, our uh, smoke test. Here we have, um, a networking file because uh, we have a lot of network uh, uh, tests, so we move them in a separate file and a common uh, .go that holds all the shared uh, function between between the smoke tests. So, when what do we do when we push a change uh, to Kubernetes itself or to a component? Uh, we have, uh, uh, as I said, we we change like a little the Sonoboy image so we can we can write so we have a job that is actually responsible for triggering uh, uh, Sonoboy itself and then retrieving the the result and the and the exit code. Uh, we also have a job to uh, delete and make sure that we start with the uh, from scratch every time because Sonoboy doesn't like if there is like already the namespace at least in our version if there is already the namespace around. Uh, so inside the Sonoboy namespace, uh, there is a that called uh, Sonoboy binary uh, driving all, driving the, the test. And these are spin ups like uh, our actual end-to-end uh, -end image. Uh, and that creates uh, all, uh, and that runs all the test. So the, the good thing about this is that every test lives inside uh, its own namespace. So we run those tests alongside uh, production workload because then we have the confidence that we're not polluting uh, other namespaces or we, are, we, we leave like sterile resources around. So what kind of test do we, do we write? Uh, we try to really think about what our users care about. Uh, and so networking, of course, is a big thing. You have a pod, you want to talk to other pods, you want to talk to the internet. Uh, we, uh, we use Istio as a service mesh and uh, we have like some uh, uh, internal configuration, uh, custom configuration to, to have a multi-cluster setup. So we want to make sure that uh, uh, that setup is still running every time we touch Istio. Uh, we have a few tests around DNS because uh, let's be honest, it's always DNS. So <laughs> you want to make sure that uh, that is working. Uh, Internal means uh, uh, we make sure that Kubernetes DNS internal resolution works. We run in AWS, so we have a bunch of uh, uh, specific tests against AWS endpoints and also uh, other tests around uh, external domains. A lot of our users uh, rely on uh, auto scaling. Uh, so, of course, we want the HPA to be up and running and also scaling on custom metrics. And since we're running in, in AWS, uh, some of you might be familiar with the concept that they have for, for giving permission and IAM roles. So uh, we want our users to be able to assign uh, the role that allows their pod to talk to the, their market or, or the database. And that functionality needs to be, uh, to, to be working. Uh, moreover, there are like a few cases or when uh, you are not changing anything at the Kubernetes level. So Adults all the same, uh, Kubernetes version all the same, uh, no flags, anything. But maybe you're changing the MI, or you are changing like some uh, uh, something. Uh, you're tuning, tuning, tuning the kernel, so uh, you want to make sure that all the nodes of your cluster are in a known state. And this is an example, like how how does a test look like? So. Uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, uh, test framework use uh, Jinko as, uh, uh, as, a, as a framework. So here you can see that there is like uh, um, 
the pod to pod uh, uh, the pod to pod test so uh, communication between a source pod to destination pod and so we we create uh, uh, the source pod the namespace and the interesting thing is in the last line you can see that with just one line we can make sure that uh, the framework aspect uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't happen any error when uh, we try to create the namespace have the pod and have the pod running then we can create a destination service with the destination pod. Again, same function to make sure that the destination pod is up and running and waiting for and ready to, to set the connection. And then in the last step, we create a service that we uh, that is going to forward the, the, the call to, to the destination pod. And then we use uh, other framework functionality to basically iterate and make the same uh, uh, call from the source pod to the destination pod, and we we make an assertion about that we are expecting a two hundred status code. If we don't if we don't get uh, that code within uh, a certain timeout, then we we know that uh, pod to pod, to pod uh, is broken, and and we raise and we raise an alert. So. Um, Mateo has taken you over how, how we implemented our, our solution there. Um, however, this didn't come without a few drawbacks, um, and we want to take you over like what we problems we ran into, some tips as well, um, as well as other options. If you're looking at this and think, I, you know, this this seems not the right fit for me, but I still want to test my Kubernetes clusters. Um, so in terms of the gotchas with our approach, the, the first one and the main one is that, as Matteo mentioned, we're, we're using um, the, uh, code from the main Kubernetes Kubernetes repo to avoid having to write a lot of boilerplate. Um, however, the, the main problem with that is, as you can see from this comment on a, an issue on the um, on the repo, it, it's not intended to be consumed this module. This, this isn't its intended use case. Um, so we need to use a workaround to get get this code to be in a usable state in our our project um and th thankfully in the same thread someone has written a script to enable us to do that um so you can use the script it's what we're using successfully we've used it to get us through multiple um, minor version upgrades of kubernetes and vendoring the new code successfully um that that works for us it works well um so yeah it's, it's certainly something i i wouldn't have any hesitation in recommending as a solution to this problem if, if this is what you need to do it's used in multiple different projects across the community as well for different parts of the kubernetes kubernetes code base as well um so the the other um problem with versioning the et code however is that the the other part of it being not designed for this means that there's no api stability guarantees like there is with you know public facing parts of kubernetes um these these are this code is written with the intent being it's explicitly tied to a given minor or a given release of Kubernetes. Um, so there's, there's no hesitation in um, renaming, removing, um, completely replacing methods. Um, and that means that when you do a minor version update of Kubernetes, you, you have an extra cost here of potentially needing to update functions. So one of the, the methods that Mattel highlighted in terms of names, creating namespaces and waiting for pods, um, that, that method has changed previously, completely changed name, and we needed to do some investigation as to what the correct method to use was now. Um, the, that's that's only a one-time um, cost, though, effectively, when you're doing a minor Kubernetes version update. So it becomes another item on your list of, we're going to upgrade Kubernetes, we're going to need to upgrade these components, we'll just need, we'll need to update the vendor code and figure out what, what um, what methods we need to use now, potentially. Um, the other thing is the the, um, the code um, provides test images, like uh, there's a static, effectively a static mapping within the code of test images and tags, um, including the repositories they're, they're pulled from. Um, if you're potentially running an air-gapped cluster or one where for security reasons, you can only pull images from, uh, from certain registries or because you don't want a third-party dependency, you may need to um, 
dive into the code, find out what those images are, mirror them, and also um, use that use the custom um, config file that Mattel mentioned to effectively configure your tests to pull them from different registries rather than the default registries. Um, there's also occasionally flaky tests. Um, so if you have very dynamic clusters where you're scaling up and down a lot, or you're running on, for instance, AWS Spot instances where your your instance can can be lost, um, Sonoboy uh, or the version we run is not the greatest at recover or uh, dealing with tests being interrupted mid run. Um, so it might you might end up with flaky tests due to the, the dynamic nature of the clusters you're running and uh, these in or something else. Um, and finally, in terms of the gotchas, you might need to run um, the run.sh script. So there's, this is a script that we, that we pull in from upstream and modify slightly um, because we want to basically make it more configurable for our use case. In our case, we want the ability to um, allow more unready nodes. Um, so that's basically an argument that we need to pass into the um, invocation of Ginkgo. Um, and that, that means we have to modify the script, but it allows us to run this on clusters that are scaling up and down because some roads might be unready. And normally that would talk, cause these tests to fail um, very quickly. Um, in terms of some tips um, that, that I'd encourage you to think about, even if you don't take this approach, like um, ca capture the behavior that your users care about, but, but that is the same as writing any test, a sort of end-to-end -end test, but put yourself in the mindset of your users and figure out what behavior you're actually trying to test is working, is still working, hasn't degraded, whatever it is you're looking for. Um, leverage the community's efforts, like not just the code, also the images that have been built. Um, one of the tests Mateo showed used an AGN host image. That's something that's built by Kubernetes test infra. Um, it, it ensures that no matter what architecture you're running on or uh, whatever, the commands that you're running, whether it's a dig, whether it's a network call, whatever it is, they're consistent in their, their, their types of response, et cetera. So those, those things, there's a lot of thought and care put into them. Make, make use of them. Don't, don't go around building your own images to do digs that might fail in weird ways on different architectures, et cetera. And finally, figure out which of your tests can be run safely in parallel. Um, obviously, if you're running these for every change against your cluster, which I would encourage you to do, you want them to run as fast as possible. So you get that fast feedback loop so that your, your tests don't become a pain point. They become an enabler rather than a pain point. Um, if, if you've listened to all that and you're still thinking, um, I'm not sure that this this approach will work for us, whether it's too much effort for, for the version upgrades or whatever it is, or you don't want to write Ginkgo tests. Um, there are a couple of other options. Um, the first is, um, I, I already mentioned the cube test framework. Um, since we did the evaluation, cube test two has become the, the solution. That's that's in a separate repo. Um, and a number of different providers have got implementations to that. I've, I've linked to the AWS implementation here as we run on AWS, but um, that enables you to spin up um, an EKS cluster quickly, run tests against it, te do some teardown. Um, that's, that's um, potentially, if you're scared about running tests on a live cluster with your production uh, traffic on it, that might be the better option for you. Um, and then there's there's some other community supported frameworks. Effectively, um, the first is Test Infra. So this is um, a bit older. It's um, not very. It's not specifically Kubernetes focused, but it allows you to test your infrastructure, whether it's provisioned by Ansible or Salt or a, a Kubernetes for a Kubernetes cluster, um, and that's that's Python based. Um, the next two are a bit more Kubernetes focused. Um, so the first is kube test, but a different kube test, not the Kubernetes kube test, which I previously mentioned. Um, and this is this is um, to enable you to use PyTest uh, in Kubernetes. So it, it makes makes use of um, it allows you to make use of the Kubernetes Python client, but in a PyTest framework. So if you're really used to writing PyTest test rather than Git test, maybe that's the, the the approach you would want to go down. Um, 
And finally, a slightly different approach is Kuber Healthy. So this is actually an operator um, that runs in cluster. It has some custom resource definitions and you basically interact with it by creating custom resources that define your tests. And it takes care of spinning up the pods and gathering results and exposing metrics about what's happened. So if that, if you want something a bit less involved in terms of you having to write everything uh, in code and building binaries, that might be the, the best option for you. That has been our talk. Um, thank you very much um, for attending.